Multiple individuals of his family and friends and law partners get on the stand and listen to that video and say, that's him on that video. Got on the stand for the first time and said, okay, I was there. He was forced into doing what he does all the time and that's coming up with a new lie when he's confronted with evidence he can no longer deny. And the only reason he did that, the only reason he did that is because all those witnesses at that witness stand said, yeah, that's him. He's there. Why would he lie about that, ladies and gentlemen? Why would he even think to lie about that if he were an innocent man? Why would he even think about that? But he got on the stand and he told you a story. And we're going to talk more about that story in a minute. But his story was, was that he didn't want to go down there. And then he went down there and, and he went down there really quick and got care of the chicken and went straight back. And he can't remember anything about what he talked about with Maggie. He can't remember their conversation at dinner. But he's, he's dadgum sure about the fact that he went down there and went straight back. But even if you give him the benefit of the doubt, his story doesn't make sense. Because that kennel video is 50 seconds. It's over at 8.45.45. Even if you give him the benefit of the doubt that he could take care of the chicken and maybe the fastest dog and chicken chase ever and put that chicken up and not say a word to Maggie and Paul and get on that golf cart and drive all the way back to the house, where does that put you? It puts you right at 8.49. At which point he claims he went inside and he managed to doze for a second. Then he's up at 9.02, perhaps the quickest nap ever. It doesn't make sense, ladies and gentlemen. It's a, a new story to fit facts he can no longer deny. From a person who, not a single person who was close to him knew who he really was. Not a single person close to him hadn't been lied to by this man. And I would submit to you that this one is the most blatant one yet. And we'll talk more about that in a second. <clears throat> what happened at 849? <clears throat> Y'all been to the scene. That feed room door is probably a bit tighter than this. But you saw the evidence from Kenny Kinsey and all the rest of them that clearly Paul was in the middle of that feed room. It's a kill zone. Nobody in there with him. He's in that room. No defensive wounds at all. His hands are down. And he takes that shot, buck shot to the chest. And any person who did that would probably think that took care of business because this buck shot, but for some reason he was canned this way and it went through. It was a million and one shot. <coughs> that it didn't kill him. Alec thought it did. Alec, the lawyer, Alec, the prosecutor, Alec is thinking through that we'll see he's manufacturing an alibi and he's also manufacturing the fact that there's two guns used. But we know, unlike the expert they call from Connecticut where they can't even get ARs, who doesn't know about people riding around on property, he doesn't know about Paul and the two guns he likes to use, he doesn't know about this family and how common those guns are together, he says, well, his only conclusion is oh, it would be practical for somebody just to, to, to fire out the clip. But this is him, this is Alec, the prosecutor, the lawyer, and he's thinking through this. He's thought through this. He's going to use two guns because it's going to confuse people that perhaps there are two shooters. But again, it doesn't make sense. Two family weapons? But he thinks Paul's shot. And you heard the testimony that Paul appears in the feed room doorway. Is Alex putting down that shotgun to pick up the blackout and is startled by Paul? And that's why the angle's like that and catches Paul like that and, and goes up into the ceiling as you've heard the testimony from Kinsey and blows 
blows his brains out. And what happens with Maggie right here? We see activity on Maggie's phone. You heard about Sandal Prince. You heard from Kenny Kinsey about the mark on her leg from the Polaris over there by the overhang next to the feed room. You've seen the diagrams and the crime scene photos that all those cases are in that area between the doorway to the feed room and where Maggie was found. You heard that Maggie had no defensive wounds. You also heard Paul and sibling from that first shot, a close range shot with no indication that he detected a threat from the person who fired that weapon. And why? Because it was him. Same with Maggie. Because Maggie sees what happens and she comes running over there, running to her baby. Probably the last thing on her mind, thinking that it was him who had done this, she's running to her baby while he's gotten picked up the blackout and opens fire at close range, again with no defensive wounds. And she takes those two shots that you heard Dr. Reber say were parallel, and it crumples her over. In those cases, you can see them move around. And takes that shot that goes through here, and she goes down flat, and then there's the shot in the back of the head. Malice? Is that malice, ladies and gentlemen? Is that malice to do that? Is that intentional harm to another with a bad intent, with an evil intent to do those things? Clearly, I submit to you, clearly it's malicious. Clearly, it's malicious. She was running to her baby. Heard that shot and was running to her baby when she got mowed down by the only person that we have conclusive proof was at that scene just minutes before. And who lied about that very fact until he could no longer do it to you last week. Alec told you he went down there in the golf cart. We'll talk about this a little bit, but they had their expert come up here with the, the two, five, two people and, and all the rest of it. Be sitting in a golf cart. But he comes up in the golf cart. But what we don't see, as I said before, is any activity from on his phone until 9.02. That the crime occurred around 8.49. To 853 down there at the feed room states exhibit 516 it's just a diagram remember that Roger Dale Davis did about the kennels and the hose there and how it wasn't put up the way he would put it up if you're going to wash off real quick what better place to do it the water, the pictures of the water in states 199 and 190. It wouldn't take long to strip down and wash yourself off. Get in that cart and head back to the house. <coughs> and then at 902, the defendant over there who wouldn't even admit until forced to that he was even at the scene, all of a sudden, he is as busy as he has ever been. 902 to 906, 283 steps. 
903, we see the system start up on the car, and that could mean that he's close by the car. Has he returned with Maggie's phone and placed it in that car? And then what do we see from 902 to 906? Not only is he 283 steps in that four-minute period, but he is making calls like crazy. And I asked him, I said, what were you doing? What were you doing? And, and even though he has a photographic memory about things that he thinks will convince you, he could not answer what he's doing during this four-minute period that is so illustrating of what we're talking about here. That for four minutes, he is not only going 283 steps, This is a defense exhibit, defense 156. Two eighty-three steps, and they put in the distance. We heard the distance isn't as accurate, but it's a, it illustrates the point. That's two hundred eight meters. Meter, you know, roughly is a yard, a little bit more, a little bit less. I don't remember, but let's say it's six hundred feet. It's a lot. And he couldn't remember what he was doing. I asked him, you been on a treadmill? Were you doing jumping jacks? What were you doing at the same time you're calling all these phones? Why is he calling multiple times? We can see right here. He's, he calls Maggie. He calls Randolph. He calls Maggie again. All of that four minute period where he's moving around. But he couldn't remember what he was doing. Just getting ready. Is the prosecutor, the lawyer, Manufacturing his alibi because he knows he's got to get to Alameda quick. He's got to compress those timelines, and that's exactly why he knew to lie about being at the kennels to start with. He's got to compress those timelines so that it would convince whoever down the road that he couldn't have done it. He's got to compress them. And that's why he's doing all that right then and there. System start up, 905.56 in the Suburban. And then, this is interesting, Maggie's phone has that orientation change to portrait two seconds before Alex's second call goes in to her phone. If it's some random vigilante, some random vigilante who knew to hide out there and counted on family guns being there, did he have ESP? Did he have ESP to move that? Or was that Alec turning the phone as he got to the Suburban, checking as he manufactured his alibi that it was coming through? And we saw how quickly out of the gate when law enforcement arrived and in his first interview, how he's immediately referring to his phone. And besides that, you've heard about Alec. You heard from witnesses he went down to the kennels, but he didn't take his phone. Is that also the lawyer and the prosecutor making sure his phone was not with them when he went down there? You heard testimony, it would be unusual for him not to take that phone down to the kennels. And then he gets underway. This call right here too. All those calls, all those steps when his phone finally goes active just minutes after he was at the scene with the victims and he lied about it and he's so busy. But let's, let's take him at his word again. Why in the world, if he's calling her so much, if he's so busy and so concerned to call her as many times as that in a four minute period, why... Why would he not just drive by the kennels? Why would he not just drive down there to say, hey, hey Max, I'm going to Alameda. What you guys doing? Hey Paul, you want to go? Why is he so busy and making so many calls but doesn't drive the less than a minute down there to see what they're up to? Why would he not do that? And you've heard testimony from Marion. You even heard it from the defendant's own mouth about whether or not Maggie 
was going to go with him to Almeida, that Alec had actually asked her to come home that night, which he denies, and said in his statement that he found out later that that was the case, that you saw the text from Blanca, and you heard from Marion that Alec wanted Maggie to come home that night to make sure of it. Malice? With all of that, why would he not just turn and drive down there? He was just there in the golf cart. Why would he not drive down there? Why is he so anxious to have missed calls were heard and he was just there and not drive down there? About the same general time period that he lied to until he tried to tell you what he told you from the stand last week. Right here, he suburban connects to the uh, Alex's iPhone. He calls Maggie at 906.52, and he's getting in the suburban right at that time. Maggie's back life goes off from 907 to 931, and you've heard the testimony from the various experts about the back life. And then he leaves Moselle Road at 907.06. All of this is fitting together. He's on the move. At 908.36, he's right here doing 42 miles an hour, and there's Maggie's phone location. And at 908.42, he's just passing. And at 908.58, just 20 seconds after he's almost at that location, he texts Maggie's phone and says, going to check on him, be right back. That text was unread. Now, There's been a lot of discussion from all the experts about the backlight issue. And every single one of them said that there's a lot of variables about that light coming on. Every single one of them said it's not going to record an orientation change unless that light is on. And you heard from each one of the experts about those variables and about the fact that there's no guarantee that it's going to come on or not come on. And you heard from Paul McManagle about that issue. And they cross-examined him about that and all the rest of it, but it's just a common sense determination about how iPhones work. About how they work. That raised awake feature is set for actual somebody lifting it up in the normal course. It is not set to respond necessarily to violent motion like flipping it. And every single expert testified to that. Every single one of them did. And then, besides that, you'd have to accept the fact that Alec is driving by just moments prior to that time. All of, this, all of these circumstances would have to go the other way of the reasonable inferences in this case. Paul McManagle got up there and testified as to these issues and as to the fact that there's no guarantee, in fact, more likely than not, that the, if the phone is violently thrown or flipped or frisbeed or whatever, it's not going to light up. And that's consistent with what every other expert said. Nine oh seven to nine twenty-two. The defendant's on the way to Alameda, and you heard 